All right, so I guess we are ready to go and uh, we have the second talk of the day. Um, we are here at Research in Options Rio 2020. Let me make a few announcements. Uh, first is that it's a real big pleasure for us uh, to have uh, a, a large audience that we have now. We actually have also quite a number of registered people in the um, in, in our conference. So we have, as of this morning, uh, more than 800 registered participants. Uh, let me also mention that this is a, a joint uh, conference between uh, IMPA and Halif University, where I am. And um, it's really a pleasure to have all these uh, uh, new participants in our in our uh, conference, and finally, let me mention that uh, um, our support comes also from Damon uh, Investment Fund, and uh, we are very thankful for their support. So, without further ado, let me introduce then Professor Lane Houston. Um, he is going to talk about pricing with variance gamma information. Lane, thank you again for being always with us for the last, I think, 14 years, 15 years, perhaps. Thank you very much, Georgie. Uh, and uh, are you hearing me OK? Yes, perfectly. And I'm uh, very good. OK. Yeah. I'll begin now. Uh, so this is a, a piece of joint work with uh, Leandro Sanchez Betancourt, who is at Oxford. And the uh, paper can be uh, found in uh, this uh, recent uh, edition of uh, Risks, and there's a version on the archive as well, of course. I'll put up this reference again just at the end of the talk. So let me begin by saying that what I propose to do is give a brief account of some new developments in the approach to information-based asset pricing that uh, Dorje Brody and Andrea Macrina and I uh, put together uh, a few years ago. Uh, so this theory is concerned with the determination of price processes of financial assets from first principles. And what I mean by that is that the market filtration is constructed explicitly rather than simply assumed into existence uh, as one usually sees in traditional approaches. So the, uh, the simplest version of the, uh, uh, the model uh, in the uh, framework that we originally conceived is as follows. So we fix a probability space and we consider a kind of simple asset that delivers a single cash flow H at some specified time uh, in the future. Uh, and the cash flow is regarded as a function of a random variable, which we think of as a kind of market factor, which is revealed at time T. In the general situation, there can be uh, many factors and many cash flows, uh, but for the present, we'll assume that there's just a single factor X and there's a single uh, cash flow at time big T, and that the cash flow is given by uh, some uh, function H uh, of X. So, in this kind of uh, situation, we'll assume for simplicity uh, that interest rates are constant and that P is the risk neutral measure. Uh, we require that the cash flow is uh, uh, integrable. Uh, we can uh, abandon the restriction that the interest rate is constant and that P is risk neutral measure and so on and so forth. But uh, to keep matters concentrated on information flows, we'll make these assumptions. So in that case, then the value of the asset is given by this familiar discounted expectation in the uh, risk neutral uh, uh, measure. Uh, so uh, since there's just a single dividend being paid at time T, the value of the asset can be uh, obtained at other times little t before big T uh, as a conditional expectation uh, through a familiar uh, formula. And we assume that the asset drops uh, abruptly to zero in value at time big T because that is when the uh, dividend is uh, paid. Uh, so here uh, ft is uh, the market filtration and what we want to do is model the market filtration explicitly. So in traditional financial modeling, the filtration is usually taken to be fixed in advance. So for example, in the uh, usual widely applied Brownian motion uh, type models in finance, the filtration is generated by an in-dimensional 
uh, Brownian motion. But in the information-based approach, we don't assume that the filtration is given a priori. Instead, it's uh, constructed in a way that takes into account the various structures of the information flows associated with the various cash flows uh, of the various assets under consideration. So in the case that there's a single cash flow, the idea is that the filtration will contain noisy information about the market factor. Uh, but this is done in such a way that when time big T is reached, then XT is uh, FT measurable. Uh, so this can be achieved by allowing FT to be generated by a so-called information process, which I'll call C. Uh, the information process has the property that for little t greater than or equal to big T, then CT is, uh, uh, is measurable in the uh, sigma algebra of, uh, of XT. Hmm. So then by constructing various examples of Cadillac processes having this property, we're able to formulate a variety of models. And the resulting models uh, are rather finely tuned to the structures of the asset uh, that they represent. So we find this uh, useful because it offers scope for a, an approach to uh, uh, risk management. Uh, so uh, while well, there's been a lot of work done on information-based asset pricing so far using various types of information processes, including those based on Brownian bridges, gamma bridges, Levy random bridges, and Markov bridges. And work has been carried out by uh, quite a number of people, and I've mentioned uh, some of the names uh, listed in this, uh, this paragraph. Uh, so in what follows, we're going to consider a new model for the market filtration based on variance gamma process. And the idea is to create a two parameter family of information processes associated with uh, the given market factor. So one of the parameters will be the information flow rate uh, sigma, and then the other will be an intrinsic parameter associated with the variance uh, gamma process. Uh, this parameter, the second parameter, has the property that as m goes to infinity, then the uh, VG information process reduces to the type of Brownian bridge information process that was originally considered by Dorji, Brody, and Andrea, uh, Macrina, uh, and I. Well, uh, let me begin by just reminding you of a few details about gamma processes. So we'll let uh, kappa and m be uh, strictly positive constants. And then by a gamma process with we'll scale kappa and shape m, uh, we mean a Levy process, uh, capital gamma, uh, such that for each value of t, the random variable gamma t is gamma distributed. Uh, so this has a well-known density, and I've exhibited it explicitly here to uh, show the dependence on kappa and m. Now you can work out the expectation and the variance uh, using the, this density, and one finds that can be expressed in terms of kappa and m, and these formulae can be inverted. So that shows you that the parameters of gamma process can be worked out uh, if you know its mean and variance at any time. Uh, now, it, the gamma processes form a two-parameter family, but we can introduce a special type of gamma process called a gamma subordinator. And this is one for which kappa is equal to one over m. Uh, the reason that we're interested in that is that in this case, the expectation of gamma is equal to T. Uh, so gamma itself behaves approximately like uh, a measure of, uh, of time. Uh, the variance, on the other hand, is given by T uh, divided by M. So for very large values uh, of M, the, uh, uh, the variance tends to go to zero. Uh, <clears throat> so now we need uh, two more ideas, the variance gamma process and the gamma bridge. So we fix a standard Brownian motion and an independent gamma subordinator, uh, then we can define a standard uh, variance gamma process by taking the Brownian motion and subordinating it with the gamma process. So we'll call that uh, V. And then it's well known and it's straightforward to check that V is itself a uh, Levy process. Of course, the variance gamma process and its uh, various uh, extensions have been investigated uh, uh, extensively in the literature. Uh, the other object that we require going forward is the so-called gamma bridge. So uh, we'll let uh, uh, gamma be a standard gamma subordinator with parameter m, and then we define the standard gamma bridge by taking gamma little t divided by gamma uh, big T. So it's well known and one can check, although I don't say that the calculation is easy, uh, that the uh, random variable gamma little t big T has a beta distribution. So I've exhibited this distribution here on this uh, slide, and you'll see the beta function appears in the uh, uh, denominator. Uh, using this density, one can work out that the mean of the 
uh, gamma bridge is little t divided by big T. And then the variance is given by the slightly more uh, complicated expression. And you can see that the expectation doesn't depend on the parameter m, whereas the variance uh, decreases as m uh, increases. Uh, now, the gamma process and the associated gamma bridge have the following well-known independence property. It's a sort of a remarkable property because it involves uh, uh, a rather extensive calculation to prove that it holds. It's not some one of these things that you can see just by inspection. Uh, so if you take the uh, sigma algebra uh, generated by the gamma bridge from time zero up to uh, time uh, little t, and then if you take another sigma algebra, G plus, which is generated by the underlying gamma process moving from time uh, uh, little t uh, uh, onwards, uh, then you find uh, that the two sigma algebras are uh, independent. So in particular, if you take a gamma bridge running from uh, time uh, little s to time t, and then if you consider any time capital T greater than little t, then those two random variables are uh, independent. Uh, so what I've discussed so far is mostly familiar or known material, but now we come on to something new. Uh, we'll introduce a generalization of the uh, Brownian bridge process. And uh, for this, we take a, uh, uh, <coughs> a gamma process and a, a Brownian motion, and we put them together according to this particular uh, uh, scheme. Uh, so we take gamma, gamma of little t and we use it to subordinate w, so it's a VG process. And then we subtract off the gamma bridge extending up to time big T and the VG process uh, at uh, time big T. And then we normalize with a factor of one over the square root of gamma uh, big T. Uh, so uh, this process uh, turns out to have uh, uh, lots of good properties uh, and we'll mention a few as uh, we go forward. Uh, first of all, you can uh, work out with calculation that uh, uh, gamma is a conditionally Gaussian, and then you can work out the expectation uh, and the variance. Uh, but with these ingredients at hand, then you can obtain the, the following result. Uh, this involves a calculation. It's not altogether trivial. Uh, and the point is that the uh, normalized variance gamma bridge and the underlying uh, uh, gamma bridge, the normalized variance gamma bridge and the underlying gamma bridge are jointly uh, Markov. So with that uh, at our disposal, then we can introduce what I call a variance gamma information uh, uh, process. So we'll let capital gamma be a normalized variance gamma bridge as we discussed a moment ago, and let little gamma be the associated gamma bridge. And then we'll let X be a random variable and we'll assume that the random variable and the two processes are independent. Uh, then we can define a variance gamma information process. Uh, and here are the various ingredients. Uh, first of all, uh, we have the normalized variance gamma bridge. You can think of that as generating the primary noise. And then we have the random variable X that's going to be, re be revealed at time big T. And then we have the uh, gamma uh, bridge, which also introduces a kind of a noise, though it's independent of the noise uh, coming from the... Uh, 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 the other uh, uh, sources. Uh, and then finally, we have the process, which I'll call uh, uh, C. So uh, when we put all these to, uh, together, then we take the market filtration to be generated uh, jointly by C uh, and gamma. Uh, and what we find, uh, and this turns out to be very useful for the valuation of assets, is that the information process uh, C uh, and the underlying gamma bridge are uh, together uh, uh, jointly uh, Markov processes. So this turns out to be uh, just what one needs for information-based uh, asset pricing. Uh, and indeed, now we're in a position to calculate the value of financial assets in this setting. Uh, so here's the idea. So recall that P is the risk-neutral measure and the interest rates are constant. And the payoff of some asset will be given by a measurable function h uh, of x, where x is the information that's revealed at time big T. Uh, the filtration will be generated jointly by the variance gamma information uh, process uh, C and the associated gamma bridge. Uh, then uh, making use of the Markov property, uh, the joint Markov property of C and gamma, uh, then you can show uh, that the conditional expectation of 
uh, the payoff of the asset, given all of the information available up to time little t, uh, can be reduced to the conditional expectation uh, depending on just the current value of the information process and the current value of the uh, gamma bridge. Now, as for the market factor, we'll allow the market factor to be a fairly general thing. So uh, we'll let uh, F sub X denote the probability measure on R associated uh, with the uh, market factor. It doesn't specifically have to be a continuous random variable or a discrete random variable. Uh, we allow a rather general uh, situation. The only thing that we require is that the payoff uh, be uh, integrable. So under that condition, then we get uh, an explicit formula for the value of the asset. And, uh, and this is it. Uh, so there's the usual discount factor from little t to uh, big T. Uh, there's the function h representing the payoff of the asset. And in the numerator, in, you'll see both the uh, information at time little t appearing as well as the value of the gamma bridge appearing uh, in two different places. And then one integrates this uh, uh, with respect to the measure uh, associated with the random variable uh, x. And then there's a normalizing uh, factor that appears in the uh, denominator. So this can be viewed as a kind of a special filtering problem uh, where the uh, noise is associated with the uh, noise driving the uh, information uh, process. Well, this is quite quite general uh, for essentially an arbitrary uh, payoff and an arbitrary structure for the market factor, uh, but we can look at some examples. And I'll look at one example uh, here in, in this talk. So we'll look at the simplest case. So one can think of this as being an application to, uh, to credit problem. So we'll look at a unit principle credit risky bond uh, without principle, so uh, without recovery. Uh, so what this means is that it either pays off one or pay off, pays off zero uh, at maturity. So we'll let h of x simply be x, and then uh, we'll assign some a priori probabilities of default. So uh, p naught is the probability of default, and p1 is the probability of, uh, of no default. Uh, then in that case, the measure associated with x is just a sum of Dirac measures weighted with the appropriate uh, probabilities. And we can work out a somewhat more explicit formula for the asset price. Uh, and uh, here it is. So one sees this uh, factor in the numerator and the denominator determined by uh, the information available at time t and the gamma bridge available uh, at time uh, uh, t. And then one can check through a calculation that uh, if little omega is the outcome of chance, then if uh, x of omega is equal to one, then the limit as little t approaches big T of the asset price gives you one, and otherwise you, you get zero. So in other words, asymptotically, as little t approaches big T, uh, the asset price uh, uh, behaves in the uh, appropriate way, either giving you default uh, or not. Uh, so just glancing at this formula, you can't necessarily visualized what the behavior of the asset looks like. So we can uh, we can plot the results. Uh, so I'll show uh, two figures below uh, where we plot sample paths for the information process and for the values of the bonds. And we're going to do this for various values of the parameter sigma. So you remember sigma determines essentially the rate at which the uh, uh, information is uh, is delivered. Uh, so what we'll see in this chart is that if sigma is equal to one, uh, this is a relatively low value for the flow rate uh, given the other market parameters. Uh, so this means that the information processes uh, can't really be distinguished from one another uh, until one nears the end of the time frame uh, of the year. Uh, so, so this means that if the bond uh, is good for one year, then it's only in the last days or weeks that one sees from the behavior of the price uh, that it's likely to default or, or not. But on the other hand, for higher values of the information flow rate, uh, one can see uh, the effect of the default uh, at an earlier stage. And for the highest value of the uh, information flow rate, then 
uh, the outcome is uh, uh, visible uh, early on. So, uh, well, here are the charts. So on the left, you'll see a plot of the information process. So this is going from time zero up to time one. Uh, and uh, these on the right, you see the, uh, the price of the bond. So you'll see that the bond uh, uh, can take a value between zero and 100. Uh, and this is over a period of one year. And you'll see at the end, some of the bonds reach 100 and the remainder of the bonds reach uh, uh, zero. Uh, in this particular illustration, we've cho chosen the a priori probabilities to be 40% default and 60% uh, no default. 40% a priori for probability for default is rather high, of course. Uh, in reality, you might ex expect it to be lower than that for a bond that you would find in the markets. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, for the purposes of illustration, we uh, show you the more extreme case. So 60% is the initial value of the bond as a percentage of the, um, uh, the principal. And you'll see that for sigma equals to one, which is this case, that uh, you can't really tell which information process is going to lead to default or not. And you can't tell which price is likely to lead to default or not until you come just within the last month or so uh, of the year. And then likewise, you can see that the information processes begin to separate or diverge uh, as you approach the termination date. On the other hand, if you raise the information flow rate from one to two in this transparency, then you can see that the separation occurs earlier on, you know, maybe after about nine months or so. And then at that point, you can tell uh, that some of the bonds are looking like they're definitely going to uh, obtain, <coughs> obtain unity and maturity, whereas others are going to uh, default. Well, we can look at the... Uh, case of sigma equals to three. And there, the distinction uh, is much sharper. The information uh, flow rates uh, diverge uh, at about two thirds uh, the way through the year. And then likewise, on the same time frame, uh, one begins to see pretty clearly which bonds are going to default and which bonds are not going to default. And if we move to sigma equals four, this is high information flow rate. Uh, then about halfway through, the information processes begin to clearly uh, diverge. And then likewise, about halfway through the year, most of the bonds, uh, although not necessarily all of them, have given uh, well, us a clear uh, signal through th their behavior as to whether uh, default is likely or, or not. Uh, so this gives one a sort of illustration of how the information-based uh, prices work in this case. And what is uh, special about this model is it's based on the VG process and the resulting formulae are all uh, highly uh, tractable. Uh, and it, it comes as a kind of a surprise because most of these information based formulae uh, get difficult you know, for more complicated information processes based on levy processes. But there's an exception that arises here. And this comes through the specific form of the uh, variance uh, uh, gamma bridge, the normalized variance gamma bridge uh, that we've employed in our uh, construction. Uh, well, uh, uh, that uh, ends my uh, uh, presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I can draw your uh, attention again to the details of the paper, uh, which are included here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lane, for this very nice presentation. And um, I'd like to open the floor or perhaps the screen to questions. Um, in the meantime, while we don't have questions, I have one question about the calibration of the model. So uh, what are the, uh, I mean, how easy or how uh, hard is it to calibrate this model? And have you tried to, to do some uh, simulations, backtesting kind of things? Uh, well, I should say that as far as testing with real data, we haven't uh, got to that stage yet. Uh, but on the other hand, for calibration in principle, yes, I mean, that can be done. Uh, and here's the point, is that what I've described here 
is how to calculate or work out the price processes of assets that are driven by the particular type of market information process that we've specified. And the information process depends on uh, two parameters. So, so the, the next step is to uh, calculate uh, option uh, prices. Uh, so if you're given those price processes, like the one that I presented a few moments ago, uh, then uh, you can go back and say, well, what if there's an option uh, that uh, matures at some intermediate time uh, before uh, time big T? So then you can work out its uh, value at, uh, at time zero, and you can work out uh, a, a collection of values for various strikes and various uh, uh, maturities. And then from, from that data, you can back out the information flow rate, uh, and you can also... Uh, gain some information about the uh, uh, the parameter uh, m. So uh, so calibration is feasible, uh, uh, and in particular, you can design certain types of options that are you know particularly efficient for uh, working out uh, one type of parameter uh, or the other. So those option prices can be used as essentially as sort of estimators. Uh, for the uh, the parameters, so that's the uh, that's the general scheme. In fact, similar ideas apply uh, in the Brownian motion type information processes that uh, we've uh, looked at uh, in the in the past. You know, which have been studied in much more detail. Sorry. Yes, very good. So uh, another question that came to, that comes to my mind and arises naturally yeah. is uh, the fact that you only have two parameters here. Doesn't it uh, make uh, the model uh, kind of um, uh, very, very uh, strict, very hard to adjust to changing markets? Well, you, you have to think of it this way, that this is a... Uh... This is, as it were, a preliminary study or a sketch for a class of model. I mean, it can be viewed as a, uh, you know, the analog would be something like geometric Brownian motion, which might depend on the, on a small number of, of, of parameters. Uh, but once you get the hang of how to uh, work with it, uh, then, of course, one can generalize to models that contain functional degrees of freedom and more... Uh, uh, more information, more more parametric information that can be uh, calibrated in principle to uh, uh, to market data, families of strikes and families of uh, maturities of options uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but um, there's no point in pursuing that until one has got the simplest models in, under control in some sense. I see. Okay. Well, I got one question from Sebastian Jaimungal here. Yeah. Going to read uh, it. Um, so uh, he says, I'm wondering why is VG special? Is it the infinite activity? Okay, well, uh, well, infinite activity processes have been uh, investigated uh, previously in the context of uh, information-based asset pricing, and in, in particular in 2008, uh, Andrea Macrina and Dorji Brody and I uh, wrote a paper uh, studying uh, models uh, based on uh, gamma-type information flows. Where, and in this case, when the, the resulting uh, gamma bridge type of information uh, turns, about, turns out to be quite uh, useful for studying problems relating to insurance. Uh, so this would be the case when uh, the random variable X, if you like, the market factor can represent, for example, the totality of the claims that an insurance company will receive by the end of the year. And then these claims ac accumulate during the course uh, of, of the year. Uh, but the, uh, it, the information process is given by a product of the gamma uh, bridge and the random variable representing the total claims at the uh, end of the maturity. So at any time little t, you know the values of the, all of the claims that have been put forward so far, 
but you're still trying to estimate the total number of claims that will uh, occur uh, by the um, end of the year. So that was the work that we did on uh, using gamma uh, processes and gamma bridges as a basis for the information. Uh, so the, the present model uh, is uh, related to that model in the sense that it also incorporates a, a, a gamma bridge, uh, but it uh, it incorporates the analog of the Brownian motion in the form of the uh, VG uh, uh, process. Uh, so if you like, there are two different uh, origins of the noise in the model, one associated with the VG process and the other associated with the, uh, uh, the gamma bridge. Uh, the VG process is indeed very special, and uh, that's what leads to uh, the exact results that we're able to obtain. Uh, it's special in the sense that it leads in the present context to um, results th that are uh, mathematically uh, satisfying. Excellent. Okay, so thank you very much again, Lane, and uh, we're going to have a coffee break, a virtual coffee break. I thank you all for attending and we are going to in about uh, 25 minutes. In the meantime, if you like, uh, please join us at our virtual coffee break that's going to show in the um, YouTube. Okay, thank you.